for this meeting of the Climate Change and Sustainability Committee of the 8th of February 2023. I see that Councillor Allison is present, as is Councillor Anderson and Councillor Barker. Councillor Callicus, I have apologies for, and I see that Councillor Horsham is here substituting for Councillor Callicus. Councillor Chalmers. Yes, I see that Councillor Chalmers is here. Councillor Clark is here. I have apologies from Councillor Margaret Cooper. Councillor Dewar. Yep, I see that Councillor Dewar is participating remotely. Councillor Fagan. No, nothing from Councillor Fagan. Councillor Gowland, I see that you're here. I have apologies from Councillor Hamilton and Councillor Convery. I see that you're substituting for Councillor Hamilton this morning. Councillor Keat. No, nope, I've nothing from Councillor Keat. Councillor Lambie. Yes, I see that Councillor Lambie is participating remotely. Councillor Lockhart. I don't see anything online from Councillor Lockhart and I don't see him present in the meeting room. I see that Councillor Loudon is, is participating, as is Councillor Mars. I have apologies from Councillor Monique McAdams, Councillor Leslie MacDonald. No, nope, I have nothing from Councillor MacDonald. I see that we have present um, Councillor McDougall, um, Councillor McGeever, Councillor Nugent, Councillor Razak and Councillor Robb. I have apologies from Councillor Ross and I'm aware that Councillor Frame is substituting for him and I see that she's participating remotely. Councillor Salamati and um, we have present also Graham Scott and um, Councillor Thompson. No, nope, nothing from Councillor Thompson. And I see that Councillor Walker is in the meeting room. Um, so with that, Chair, we have a number of uh, officers at the meeting and I'll pass back to you for the business. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that. Um, just before we get started, uh, everyone, I've got the pleasure of introducing to committee Alison Brown, who is our new Head of Enterprise and Development. Um, on behalf of everybody, I'd like to welcome her to the role and wish her every success in it. It is a hugely important one, and we're delighted to have your skills and knowledge uh, available to us. So thank you. Um, and with that, I'll ask for any declaration of interest. I don't see any. Uh, moving on to item two on the agenda, it's the minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, we can find them in pages three through eight of the pack. And can I ask that the committee uh, agree these as a correct record? Thank you. Uh, items for uh, decision. Item three, pesticide-free council motion. Uh, pages nine through 16. This is the update on the motion, and I'm going to invite Colin Reid to speak to it. Sorry, Control. Colin, hold on a wee second. We're having a wee issue there, but it's... That's it. I see you now. When you go Thank Cheers. you. Aye. The purpose of the report is to provide a final report on the trials undertaken with regard to alternative weed control methods and proposed recommendations following those trials. Recommendation. The committee is asked to approve the following recommendations, note the content of this report and agree the recommendations outlined in section 4.6. The background to this is that on 16th of December 2020, the Council considered a motion regarding a proposal for South Lancashire to become a pesticide-free council. On the 10th of February 2021, the Climate Change and Sustainable Committee considered a report which outlined work undertaken in respect of the approved motion and set out information in relation to that motion. A full report was presented to the Climate Change and Sustainable Committee on the 25th of August 2021, providing members with an update on the trials requested by the previous committee. Given the extent and time required to evaluate the impact of the further trials, it was agreed to provide a final report early in 2023. Number four, trial update and recommendations. Ground services, where it was undertaken a series of trials of alternative methods of weed control, has in the main continued to use glyphosate, a range of surfaces, in the absence of a reliable and affordable alternative. Reasons for using herbicides are outlined in Appendix 1. The service has, however, reduced the application in areas such as grass verges, where grass cut maintenance is not affected. 
The service is also amended the timetable for application of school grounds, providing this core function during school holidays. 4.3. The table below sets out the volume of glyphosate used by the service over the last four years, with a 30 per cent reduction in usage since passing of the Council motion in 2020. This is a significant achievement and testament to the work undertaken to reduce usage in specific areas and trial and alternative methods. Appendix 2 provides further detail in these trials. A sum of each trial is assessed against three categories, climate control and cost, and the recommendation is shown in the table below. Overall, the trials can be considered a success, as usage of glyphosate is reduced by 30 per cent during the trial period. However, it is evident that there are no clear alternatives at this point that would allow the complete removal of glyphosate from the Council's weed control approach. Some methods proved expensive or resource intensive, whilst others have negative environmental impacts or are simply ineffective in controlling weed growth. <coughs> the trial process has demonstrated a clear direction of travel for decreasing usage of glyphosate. It is recommended that the service continues to use five of the eight alternatives tested and expand usage beyond the pilot areas to maximise effect. Financial implications are outlined in section six. This approach will also support the delivery of the Council's obligations as part of the new National Action Plan on the sustainable use of pesticides. The Action Plan requires, not, requires councils to reduce use of herbicides and test alternative methods of weed control. The Council is complying with these commitments, with all staff appropriately trained in the application of herbicide and registered with the legislative bodies. Number five, employee implications. The new method of weed control will now be incorporated within day-to-day -day operations with staff receiving any additional training required for equipment and machinery. Financial implications. During the first year of trials, the service purchased a hot foam system at a cost of £15,000. It is proposed to purchase additional man-care lances and mechanical brushing sets at a to total cost of £23,250 and lease additional compact tractors at a cost of £10,000 per annum. The one-off costs will be met by reprofiling current machinery and equipment inventory to include new weed control tools. The recurring additional leases spend will be offset by reduced annual spending glyphosate with a current estimate of £11,000. Thank you very much for that, Colin. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions and invite members to make their desire to speak known uh, now, uh, if they do wish to speak in this item. First up, we've got uh, Ross Clark. Thanks, Chair, and thank you for that report. I know it says climate control cost uh, in the assessment of these methods. Has there been consideration to the effect on bees and other such insects? I'm aware of reports in the past of, you know, particularly glyphosate being harmful to honeybees. It is. So has there been consideration of that in, in these trials? It's, it's, it's looking at the context of, of where we, we normally apply our herbicides. Uh, there has been a, a number of various reports, etc., where there's a, an assumption that we're, we're spraying huge swathes of grassland and, and pollinators, etc. We generally spray or apply herbicides on footpaths, hard stand, um, edges, below hedges. Uh, it's, it's, it's not these kind of areas. So the actual impact on you know, insects, wildlife, etc., is negligible in that extent and what we do, um, but obviously it's part of the consideration. Yeah, thank you. It's good that consideration has been taken of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John Anderson. Thanks, Chair. 4.4 <coughs> uh, here. Uh, the chart shows that we are going to continue with six of the alternatives that were trialled on page 11 and 4.6. It states we're only going to continue to choose five of the alternatives. What one is right? It's five. Six includes glyphosate. Right, so... OK. Thanks, John. Um, uh, more is Zach. Thank you. Thank you, Colin, for the report. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, a big issue is weeds that are regrowing quite quickly because mm -hmm. of the fact that, you know, once they've been done. When we're using the new methods, um, are we going back to it in a more regular basis to the paths that are being um, done with the new methods? That's, that's the first question. What about the 
the weeds, the damage that's doing to the paths, you know, with the fact when they're growing, they're expanding and then they're loosening the paths up. And is there going to be an impact to that as well? Yeah. Um, Third question, sorry. Well, sorry. let's ask them all together, Colin, or do you want me to wait? <laughs> and on you go. Okay. Um, we've had uh, we have had issues with um, weeds um, being a bit of a tr trip hazard in the wet as well, because it was, you know when they're wet and uh, with the rain, and especially with winter, um, it made it slippy for the elderly. So I know that it's nothing we can do in winter because of uh, what's happened, you know, because it's just residual um, um, growth that's just kind of dying away in winter. But then it does leave, you know, um, plants that are quite slippy. More than anything else. If the if I can take the first and the second one, um, and the third one's linked as well. Um, on paths, uh, slab paths, star paths, uh, slab edges, path edges, we will probably continue to use glyphosate on them um, because they have, they are the best means of control. Um, the, the alternatives, you're right, they, they do require reapplication, um, and that's what we need to that's what we need to work out, and we need to come up with action plans on the use of them. But in relation to your question, the, the, the paths and that will continue to be glyphosate. We do, however, intend to um, purchase um, dual sweep um, brushes, heavy duty brushes, which are, we think are particularly effective with uh, slab paths. Mm -hmm. So basically they, they remove the full weed and the full root. Um, and the following the trials we had with them, we felt they would be good to be used where you can remove the bulk of the weed, including the root, so you reduce the actual the actual trip hazard, um, and therefore negating the need for continual applications. Um, but that is something we're going to be going forward in the future. But basically, for hard surfaces, we'll continue with glyphosate. The alternatives will mainly be on these other areas, such as you know, roundabout schools, soft surfaces, um, play areas, where we, we feel that we can we can we can use them better there. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that. Ross uh, Gowland. Thanks, Chair. Um, good to see the Council seek alternatives to pesticides. I think it's a, a step in the right direction. I think the 30% reduction in usage of, of glyphosate is really good to hear. Um, just on, on bees, I mean, I can, I can feedback, feedback later to not take up the time of the whole committee, but I still think bees are likely to be affected with the use of glyphosate um, if they be to be used in sort of hedgerows, rural areas, different places. If I'm, would I be right in saying that? Um. Over, the, over the last two years, and based on the trials we've done, um, as I go back to the first, the first answer, we believe the impact, I mean, there will be impact, we're not saying there won't be impact, but if I consider, if I, if I look at the options, you know, if you're a, if you're a bee, um, and you look at the options there, glyphosate of, the, of some of the options are, are probably the least, effect, least effective on bees and insects and things like that. Uh, hot foam, um, yeah, we're going to trial that, but again, we need to watch what we're doing with that. Um, it's one of the alternatives was an, ac an acetic acid, um, which obviously, if, if come into contact with insects, is, is pretty, pretty bad. So that was one we dropped right away uh, on the basis that there would be an impact using that type of um, chemical um, for controlling. So we've took, the, we've took a measured approach that I'm not saying there won't be an impact, there obviously will be some impact, but again, I will go back to the areas where we're using it. Do you know, it tends to be um, narrow verges, you know, footpaths. We're not spraying huge areas um, where it's lots of you know, wild grasses or, or, or pollinators. Thank you. Um, David Booth would like to come in here, so we'll just go to, to yourself, David. Thanks very much, Chair. And it was really just underlying that last point that, that Colin made. That I, I think that in some places where they're using that, that chemical, where it's been used in an untargeted way, um, would have a bigger impact in terms of insects and bees. But in terms of our operatives are trained uh, and have the right equipment to have a much more targeted use of it. So it's, it's a much more fine yeah. uh, use of it. Um, so, so I think Colin's right. Um, it's not to say that there, there, there won't be be an impact, but the impact has been minimalised as much as possible. That's helpful. And Kirsten Rob.
Got it now. Um, just to come in on, on the bees, um, the, to pick up your important point there about that there, there is a nature crisis, so we have to reduce any exposure to our, you know, without bees we wouldn't be here at all, there'll be no food left. So if we can reduce exposure as much as possible, but it's also linked to the biodiversity work because the sort of scientific research says that bees are more vulnerable to glyphosate when there's less food for them around. So the work that the council can do on biodiversity and maximise food sources for, for bees and insects will really help reduce any vulnerability to glyphosate as, uh, along with uh, reducing use where they can as well. Thanks very much for that, uh, Kirsten. Uh, right, I see no further requests uh, to speak in this item, so I'm going to ask the committee to agree the report. Actually, Kirsten would like to say something else, so on you go. <laughs> uh, thanks. Did you want to add anything? No, on you go. No. On you go. Um, maybe it's just worth reminding um, people about the motion itself. It was put forward because there was kind of public, and public health and environmental reasons concerns about it. So it's good to see the work done to try and reduce it. But bear in mind the licensing conditions of glyphosate are to reduce exposure to vulnerable groups. So looking at schools, which the council are doing, play parks, um, public areas, uh, care garden schemes. So it'd be good to see a plan going forward about how we will reduce in those areas. Um, so I'd like to request if we could get a report back next year about how we've been getting on and trying to meet those licensing conditions. Um, the motion also asks for the uh, public to be told about where, where we're spraying, so if there can be some, some action done on that as well. Um, I understand the public can also request if their areas can become glyphosate free. Um, they can send an email in um, and there is demand amongst the public through the, the grounds participatory budgeting report that they want the public want more room for nature and less pesticide spraying. So there is a public demand for this. So hopefully um, we'll see more action on it going forward and just to thank the officers for the work they have done on this. Yeah, uh, thank you. David, I think, wants to come in on that. So, David. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, um, yeah, we're happy to bring a, another report uh, next year in terms of uh, progress along the, 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 those lines. Um, I just would point out that, and I think this comes through heavily in the report, it's about getting that correct balance between um, controlling weeds the most effective way and, and, and the implications of not controlling weeds effectively uh, are, are poor for the the general public and also trying to reduce where we can the use of, of chemicals. So we'll, we'll continue along the, the journey as we can. But I mean, just on, on the point of if people write in and they ask if the area can be glyphosate free, and um, we would need to balance that with the, um, you know, the needs of, of the overall community in terms of, of making sure that the, the areas remain weed free. Thanks. Thank you. And sorry there, uh, Kirsten, for cutting you off. I didn't realise I'd done so, so apologies. Um, Right, well, no further question, uh, questions on the board. Um, I'd ask the committee to agree the report. Uh, agenda item four, pages 17 through 70 of your packs. Uh, I'm going to invite Julie Richmond to speak. This is uh, the 2022 to 2027 Action Plan on Sustainable Development and Climate Change Strategy. Julie. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> Um, hopefully you'll recall that the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Strategy for the period 22 to 27 was approved by the full Council on the 15th of June last year and it was reported to this committee in August last year. It was noted that the accompanying action plan to the strategy was still to be developed. Uh, we have an interim action plan for this first year, 22-23 of the strategy, and we are currently implementing that. This will be reported at the next agenda item today. <laughs> However, this report is seeking approval of the longer term action plan covering the remaining term of the strategy through to 2027, as well as the identified priority action areas that we'll work on next year. The five year action plans attached to Appendix 1 and the priority action areas for the year 22 23 are attached to 20, uh, Appendix 2. So section three of the report provides background on the development of and the agreed themes within the strategy the Sustainable Development Climate Change Strategy and 
also how the strategy <coughs> fits with the Council plan and the Council's climate change duties and associated targets and goals. Section 4 explains the format of the five-year improvement actions, which are detailed at Appendix 1. These actions have been mapped to the four main themes of the strategy and listed under the 13 strategic priorities of the strategy. The actions have been considered in terms of budgeting and resource implications, as well as which council service will lead on or play a supporting role in the delivery of each action. Um, section 5 refers to the actions for next financial year, and Appendix 2 provides a summary of those actions, which will be progressed throughout 23-24. These actions are effectively a breakdown of the key steps which were identified within the five-year action plan. So there are key milestones which will sit below each of these actions, and again, these have been developed in consultation with the various services. And in line with normal reporting protocols, a quarter two and a quarter four update will be reported to this committee using the Council's corporate reporting system, IMPROVE. Section 6 to 10 detail the other implications to be considered, and it should be noted that the financial implications of implementing the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Strategy and meeting nat national and global targets is, is significant. All council services have a responsibility to commit to and implement the actions to ensure all these targets are met. So if I can refer back to the purpose of the report, the committee has been asked to approve the five-year actions detailed in Appendix 1 and the priority action areas that have been identified for next year as detailed in Appendix 2. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much, Julie. Um, I'd invite any members who wish to speak on this item to let their intentions be known now. Uh, I currently have a few in the list. Uh, first up, we've got Councillor Clark. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks for this report and action plan. I've got two questions, so I'll ask that the first one get the answer and come back at, after that. Uh, in relation to page 31, I would obviously raise the importance of constant engagement with the climate youth forum. Uh, they've got so much to add to the discussion and rightfully have the ability to hold us to account as politicians. Uh, and I think they do a, a great job at that. And I want to see a, a lot more of that and as much as we, we can. Uh, and it sort of links on to what's on the, the next page about embedding sustainability in the curriculum. Uh, for me, this is really positive to see. I'm not sure how linked it is, but something that the youth forum have been asking for is more climate education in schools. I know a lot of good work is already going on uh, with the youth forum. I was at the, the school's climate conference. But I was just more to, to ask, will the youth forum and young people be involved in shaping this education going on in, in the curriculum or, curriculum around climate change and sustainability. Yeah, uh, David Booth wants to answer that one. So, David. I thank, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Clark. The, um, the, the education uh, rep uh, in, in the climate change sustainable uh, is, is Lynn Sherry. Lynn's not, not here today, so I can ask the best I can and try and get you a fuller answer. Um, but the Lynn uh, represents education on the Sustainability Steering Group, which is a group that, uh, which takes forward uh, the, this strategy uh, within the Council. Uh, and she also has very strong links in with the Youth Forum. Um, and she, she feeds back in, in, in a two-way process in terms of with the Youth Forum and uh, with her, her Sustainability Steering Group. Um, so. Um, there already is that, that, that kind of model of communication be, 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 between uh, taking this forward. But also, um, within education itself, we, as we understand that there's a, a officers that deal directly with curriculum and they're plugged into that process as well as we try and uh, bring climate change and sustainability related issues into the, in, into the, um, the school curriculum. Um, so a lot of work as that is going, uh, is going on, but I'm happy to ask Lynn to provide a, a fuller response in due course. If, fa thank you for that answer. I think it's important that young people are involved in in shaping this. I'll move on to my, my next question uh, on page 51 uh, in relation to the uh, Climate Emergency Fund. Just to ask how many groups have applied and have been successful and what's the success rate of groups applying and then obviously being successful? David? 
you. Thanks, thanks very much, Chair. Thanks again, Councillor Clark. This is where I, I kind of get to point to somebody else in the, in the, the table here. So I wonder if uh, I know Gillian, you recently provided some statistics on that. If you, if you can recall them, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for your question. Um, yeah, so to date, 32 groups have successfully applied for the climate grants and a further £75,000 is ring-fenced for community groups for financial year 2023-24. <coughs> um, so the fund will be relaunched in April and it's anticipated that the fund will be allocated in full. Um, in terms of if bids that were unsuccessful, um, there have been eight rejected climate applications. Three applications were not from established community groups. Um, three applicants were asked for further info and despite several emails, they didn't um, apply for the fund. Um, and one's been dealt with directly with ground services, so they, they weren't in need of funding. Um, total of 25 um, internal climate projects have also been um, funded um, through the fund. Um, and we also have the, the food um, fund as well, linked to the Climate Emergency Fund. Um, and for that, we had... Um, can you see? Eight. Sorry, I've lost track. I'll confirm the number for that. Yeah, thanks. If, thank you for that answer. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a request to speak from Councillor Katie Loudon. Katie. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a, a quick question about the pilot project um, to reduce the level of food waste in schools. It's on page um, 55 and 56. Um, I just wondered if we could have some more details about that just now or if it's something that we could come back to at a later date. Um, I'm just thinking in practical terms, are we talking about sort of counting leftovers here or weighing waste? And is it going to involve um, packed lunches as well as um, school dinners themselves? Thanks, Chair. Thanks for that, Katie. I believe Kevin Carr has some information on it. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for the question, Councillor Loudon. Yeah, we've, we've, the project's underway, the pilot's underway, so we've been creating some waste warriors, as we're calling them in schools, and, and what they've been doing is, is weighing out the food waste uh, during the, the, the lunchtime service and trying to create some kind of competitive environment, if you like, to, to reduce the food waste. So we're in the process of evaluating how successful that's been. I'm happy to provide an update, actually, to the forum. Uh, the engagement through the schools has been really good. It's been really positive so far. Um, as I said, I'm happy to bring a, an update on it once we went through the evaluation process. Thanks very much for that, Kevin, uh, and look forward to that update. Uh, Councillor John Anderson. Uh, thanks, Chair. On page 34, <coughs> regarding the EV chargers, there's a statement here saying a further funding bit has been submitted to the Living Lot Fund for greater expansion. First of all, is that in reference to the second bid that we, we put in? Or is there a third bid that's already been put in? And on that, how damaging to the strategy is the UK government's rejection of the levelling up bids that we've been submitting for this? Thanks very much, John. Before I ask David to come in and answer that, let me just say that I agree it was hugely disappointing that what I understand to be excellent bids from South Lanarkshire Council uh, have not been accepted under the Leveling Up Fund. There's a lot of scepticism around the UK about how this fund uh, is actually manifesting in our communities and certainly South Lanarkshire is one of those that has lost out and we believe unfairly. Um, so I echo very much your points and for the answer to the specifics, I'm going to pass to David. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Anderson. Um, <clears throat> yes, it, this is uh, this refers to the recent <clears throat> unsuccessful levelling up fund bid. The, the, um, the announcement of that bid uh, came out after these papers had been produced and were in the system. So, um, so the um, as as, <clears throat> as you have both uh, intimated, so so it's hugely disappointing we haven't got that money. That that money would have allowed us, in terms of the EV infrastructure, to um, to put at scale in that pace to expand the EV in infrastructure. Um, so obviously that money is no, no longer a, or, or, or not, we weren't successful in that particular bid. And what we will do is we will continue to, to look at uh, areas of external funding uh, across the, the, the various other funds that are available um, as, uh, as, as we try to extend the electric vehicle uh, infrastructure network. 
um, and the rate to which we can expand the network will be determined on the availability of funding and the resource we can put into it. Um, so as far as we're concerned, it's not a case that we're, we're, you know, we'll stop this altogether, but uh, it is true to say that in the absence of the levelling up fund, uh, the rate of which we can expand will be determined on the ability for us to generate additional income elsewhere. Thanks. Chair, can I just ask, might not, might not be appropriate to put the director on the spot here. Uh, do we have a reason for the rejection for the second bid? I know you couldn't answer that at the last uh, I think, executive meeting. Is, is there a reason for them rejecting it? I know the first one was very spurious, the rejection. Uh, I'm just wondering if they've used something similar to reject the second one. Because we all know Richard Sunak made it quite clear he wants the money to be spent in the Tory shires and not in South Lanarkshire or anywhere else in Scotland. Uh, thanks for that, John. I'm not going to ask David to comment on the latter part of that, um, though um, I think uh, largely across the council there will be a lot of um, sympathy uh, 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 with that sentiment. Um, but, David, if I can ask you to, to deal with the more f um, less politicised element of the question, should I say. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Anderson. Yep, yeah, ha happy to answer the bit I can answer. Um, the, oh, <laughs> um, so we all, all that we've received to date has been a, a, a letter for each of our bids rejecting them. Um, we've asked for further information and feedback on the rationale and the reasons behind those uh, rejections, um, but we haven't as yet received that. Thank you. And if I can just uh, assure colleagues as well that if we do get any feedback, um, it will be shared with, with members. Um, I've got a, uh, Councillor Julia Mars. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I can first of all absolutely welcome the, the climate um, emergency funding going out to local groups and, and being allocated. Uh, allocated to so many. Um, I wonder whether this um, funding could be considered going forward in line um, with the um, community wealth building actions. Um, they're noted on page 53 and largely centre on the, um, the, the more auditable, um, uh, easily auditable um, issues of, of um, local procurement and, um, and high quality local jobs, which are absolutely important. But I wonder whether the actions of the climate emergency funding could be looked at with, through that lens going forward. Thanks for that, Julia. Uh, David, would you like to comment? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Mars. Um, we, we can raise the issue. I, I, I don't know, if, uh, as we sit here at the moment, in terms of what I do know is that this, this you know, we've got a certain amount of funding in, and uh, we're, we're, um, we're, we're getting that money out to the to the groups uh, and to the successful applicants. Um, uh, in terms of its ongoing uh, uh, linkage into uh, the community wealth building process, we can we can raise that with that group. It's not a group I sit on. However, officers will, I will have sit on it and, and, and we'll raise that through that route. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ross Gowland. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'd just like to congratulate officers on the report. I think there's some really good stuff in there going forward in terms of... Um, I look forward to working with some of the food and drink businesses with regards to my role as the, the food champion for South Lanarkshire. Um, I know there's a PhD uh, student, a three-year study on social economic impact of climate change in South Lanarkshire. Um, I, I, I welcome that. I think um, domestically in terms of climate justice in, in, in particularly my patch in Clysel South, but other areas across South Lanarkshire, um, I think uh, the former mining areas that are, uh, well, economically depressed, um, and there's also, uh, I think there's a lot of potential there for working with communities who are who are rural and also um, who don't have much connection to the land. So I think that would be quite an interesting study going forward. Um, okay, thanks. Um, thanks very much for that, Ross. Um, I completely agree. The opportunities afforded by the PhD student should be invaluable. And we look forward to that. Um, I have a request to speak from Kirsten Robb. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, it's a power of work there, Julie. Thanks very much for all that, pulling all the different threads of the, the climate issue together from across the council. Um, thinking about the big picture, what our carbon footprint is, and I see the work, there's work on page um, 38 on preparing a route map to reduce emissions. Uh, when do you expect to have that? Um, 
and will the council and partners, I know it's not all just about the council, uh, will the council and partners set an area-based target and how they're going to achieve that over the years, just so we've got something to, to work towards so we know where we're going? Uh, Julie? Apologies, there's a bit of a lag here. Thanks, Councillor Rob. Yeah, that, that work's ongoing at the moment, actually. So we're hoping we've had a draft report from the consultants working on that, that sort of piece of work, um, advising us on how we could develop an area-wide emissions route map, uh, who, who, who the stakeholders would be, who we would have to, to involve in part of that. So we're hoping to have the, the final report in the next month or so, at which point we'll collate our thoughts and we'll bring it back to this this committee for um, decision on what we how, how we take that forward because that's not something that we've done before so um how we involve other other partners within the community in that whole journey yeah um you can follow up with <clears throat> feeling. okay yeah well thank thanks for that julie look forward to hearing more um yep uh and the, one of the fastest ways to cut emissions is on a, in our buildings and so on. Um, so I noticed that a lot of the climate emergency funded, um, there's a lot of projects, pilot projects that have uh, helped the council innovate or look in more detail at what's required. Um, I noted that the internal fund is now used up, if you can confirm that. Um, and is there, are there any internal plans to top up that fund to make sure that the pipeline have worked to cut emissions and investigate how to cut emissions is going to be um, continued. David Booth. Um, th thank you very much. Uh, as I understand it, yes, that, that, that fund is, uh, has now been used up. Uh, there are no uh, additional uh, resources uh, in, in play at the moment in terms of taking that, that forward, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, David and Kirsten. Uh, Councillor Ralph Barker. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, right, I do apologise that I've not been able to get this concern, um, you know, I don't know, properly, properly defined. Uh, I really haven't had time, but I'll explain what it is. It starts with priority four on page 33, but also in more detail in agenda item five, page 106. So just to go over the concern briefly, it is all about environmental transport routes, <coughs> um, which, which um, are in both these agenda items. Scottish Government is enacting, well, in fact, has given guidance on protection of routes uh, for the future. Um, and in particular, um, it is old railway track beds, which many see as future greenways, one way or another. And yet at the previous planning committee to this, and this is why I have not been able to go into detail, seemed to expend you know, considerable effort to take a different approach to this protection of possible greenways uh, in that Consent was given for sporadic house building on such a route and they invoked uh, material considerations which you know, you know not to go in not to go into here um, but I mean apart from anything else there was a um, a community push to make that route into um, a greenway if you like walking route cycling route and yet we now have consent for sporadic house building um, on that route. And it does seem to be the opposite approach to government environmental guidance, if you like. Um, I will try and take this up and perhaps bring it back to a future committee. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Ralph. Um, without knowing the specifics of the case, I'm kind of loath to comment on it. But, um, but thank you for bringing it to our attention. We'll certainly look into the matter. Um, and if I can move on to Councillor Morizak. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, my, my comments are on page 30, about page 37. Firstly, can I thank the officers for the previous standards report. Now, they've done a lot of work, good work on it, and just just like to acknowledge that. Um, 
sustainable travel choices. Um, walking and cycling is usually a very healthy option and uh, it's excellent for summer and winter. It can be problematic, especially cycling with the bad weather and poor visibility for vehicles and there's more likelihood of a, an accident. So for me, the, the big one would be public transport, that you need a good public transport so that it takes people from stopping from using cars and uh, push, put them on to buses. But the problem is that, and train, sorry, the problem is that our bus service isn't fit for purpose. We have routes that, um, especially in rural areas and smaller towns and also towns where they're, they're, they're only going to the viable routes <laughs> and they're ignoring the, the other ones. Every time we as councillors bring this up, uh, because it's outside our remit, um, it, it gets ignored by the bus companies. And uh, I, I think that they, that's a for me, it's a big concern because we're talking about sustainability and at the same time, we're, we're tying our hands behind our back because of that. And that's where my concern is. And the second thing is that when you look at London and Manchester, what they've done with their routes and their transport system and everything else, that seems to be the way forward where, you know, they take control of it and every route's covered and then it makes it a lot more sustainable and like it puts people onto buses and trains rather than cars. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for that, uh, Mo. Uh, I find myself in complete agreement with you, as you, as you know, on this issue. Um, the lack of bus services uh, uh, that are accessible and, and usable to the public is absolutely something that holds back people uh, from living meaningful and fulfilling lives, taking advantages uh, of opportunities that others enjoy. It also costs businesses access to customers and to staff. It is an absolutely shocking state of affairs. Um, the last council passed a motion just uh, as one of its final acts of business that all parties supported um, that looked to establish greater public control, and that's South Lanarkshire's official position. Um, and I would hope others will join us in progressing that. But without central government, um, support for that is very difficult, as everyone knows. Uh, I'm glad you also pointed out the success of the, the different models that are in use in London, Manchester and elsewhere. There's a successful model in Edinburgh as well, whether it's franchising or direct uh, public ownership. Either way, it does involve more public control. And I would like to see the councils across uh, the Glasgow City region, across the Strathclyde region, uh, work together to achieve that. We will require central government support for it. Um, so, thank you for your comments. I, I don't know if you want to come back in. Chair, apologies. I meant to add that, um, that the other big problem is that it's impacting on our other services like the NHS because it's missed appointments, because of the fact that the bus hasn't turned up, the bus is running late, and the fact that the, the, the person that's ill or elderly has having to walk up to the middle of the town in order to get the transport or try and get a taxi wait for a taxi. So there is there is a bigger impact as well and there's a bigger impact on health as well. And I think until we can until we can get to grips with that, then that, I think we'll always struggle. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I completely agree. I don't, I don't think there's an issue there that maybe officers can, can take up, but I, I, as I understand you'll know, but um, I, I do fully agree. And this has been identified uh, uh, at other levels as well, uh, is that it's a key re requirement for us to get to net zero. So thank you for raising that um, today. Um, the final question I'm going to take is from Councillor Alex Allison. Alec. Thanks, Chair. Um, I hope I'm not covering anything that's been covered already because uh, I lost my conferral link there for some time. Listening to Councillor Razak there, um, I have to agree with a lot of what he's saying regarding transport. Even in the rural area, it's even worse where you perhaps cannot get back on the same day or you need to be a whole day somewhere to be able to get public transport in both ways. Two other things to say. One was generally, how does this tie into other resources? Um, there is always a climate change item on each um, agenda when, when, when we're looking at an issue, but do we have any say that they have to now implement some of the things that we are asking for here, or can planning or roads or anybody else do whatever they believe, which may not be what we're discussing here. And secondly, the one in particular that I noted is to promote healthy and sustainable food, including fair, fair trade. 
Surely another one there that should be equally important is the word local, um, so that it is not a being tran transported huge distances and causing um, a climate issues. Thank you very much for that, Thanks. Alec. Uh, I'm going to ask David Booth to come in on some of the items you've brought up there. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Allison. Um, take, taking each point in turn, in terms of the, how this links to the other resources and other business of the Council, the, um, th this, this was pulled together uh, in full partnership with all the different resources. We've got representatives of each resource uh, that sit in the Sustainability Steering Group, and, and they were fully uh, engaged with in, in this process. So, so what you see in front of you here, I suppose, is a, a a representation of the overall Council's approach to, to, to climate change and sustainability. Um, and um, as, as you rightly say, within each report going to um, each committee, there is an element in there which, which talks about climate change, and that should link back to this approach here, that we, uh, if, if it's agreed by committee here today. Um, the officers, the climate change sustainability officers, although they sit within uh, my resource, um, they, they work hand in glove across every other resource as well. Uh, and we've got some presentations uh, and reports coming from other resources to this committee, uh, particularly on the Council's building stock uh, uh, over, over the months ahead. Um, so so the, there, is, there is a lot of work that's going on to make sure that this is a fully, fully joined up approach. In terms of your, your second point about um, the, 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 the word local, um, it may not have been there, but, I, but our approach has always been and always will continue to be to try and support local um, food networks um, for the very reasons you, you say, for a number of reasons, what, the, the, in terms of uh, reducing food miles, in terms of uh, from an environmental point of view and also from a, from a local economic development point of view, um, we're always going to continue to support uh, local. So although that word might, have, might, might not be, be, be prominent in, uh, in the point that you raised there, it is, it is baked into the, um, to the work that we're doing in terms of our approach to food. Just going to follow up, Chair? Yes, please do, Alec. Yeah, David, then, so if it's already been done, could it not area not be added to this paper so that it's actually written down there, not just something that's done without being recorded? Yep, David. Yep, yep, I, 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 we're happy to do that. It is, it is what's been done. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alex. I think everybody would be quite happy for the, the word local to be emphasised there. Um, just, I'm not going to take any further questions on, on this item, but just to say on page 28 of uh, the report, there is a mention of the climate emergency training available to members. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who did attend the, the recent workshop uh, on that and remind people that there's an opportunity still to sign up for the accredited training, uh, which takes place early next month. Um, it'd be good for as many members as possible to do so, certainly at least one from each group. So thank you to all. Um, can I ask the committee to agree the report? Uh, agenda item number five, uh, pages 71 through 110 of your packs. It's an item for noting on sustainable, de sustainable development and climate change strategy uh, for the quarter two progress report. Uh, can I invite Gillian Simpson to speak? Thanks, Chair. So the purpose of this report is to present the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Strategy Quarter 2 Progress Report for 22-23, which covers the period from the 1st of April to the 30th of September 22. Um, this is a one-year interim action plan, which was agreed while, we, while the full action plan from the previous agenda item was being developed. Section 4 of the report summarises the progress to date. So first of all, the key performance measures. So of the 28 KPIs, five were green or on target as at the end of September. One was amber and one KPI was identified as red. As noted in section 4.3, the red measure relates to the percentage of household waste that is recycled and there is some commentary on current progress and the action that's being taken included within the report. As we're only reporting halfway through the year at this stage, um, there were 11 measures that we're not able to report on as yet at quarter two. There are also 10 measures which are included for contextual purposes only. In terms of the improvement actions, there are 47 actions in total for the interim action plan, and the vast majority of these were either on complete or on track as at the end of September. 
There were six amber actions where minor slippage was reported at quarter two, and the justification for these delays and associated actions are included within Appendix 1. No actions were identified as read. Section 4.6 pulls out some of the key highlights for the period, including the approval of the new Sustainable Development Climate Change Strategy and the new Litter Strategy for the Council. Sections 5 to 9 detail other implications to be considered, and the full improved report can be found in Appendix 1. Um, so just to refer back to the purpose of the report, which is for committee to note the performance against the interim 22-23 action plan as at quarter two. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Gillian, Councillor Ross Clark. Thanks, Chair, and thank you for that report. There are a few posts mentioned here that recruitment is ongoing for. I think it's the waste education officers, uh, biodiversity officer and temporary waste service assistants, if I've got that right. Just to ask how the recruitment is going for these positions. Uh, Kevin Kerr. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I can give you an update. The Biodiversity Officer is now in post, which is really positive news. And we're just concluding the recruitment for the Waste Awareness Officers. We went out initially for two, and we were only able to recruit one, so we're now concluding the recruitment for the other post. Same as Waste Assistance as well, so we're just concluding that process. So it's moved on since last time. Thanks very much for that, Kevin. I have no further request to speak. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm going to ask the committee to agree to note the report. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item six is urgent business. I have uh, none has been brought forward to me. So with that, I'm going to thank you all for your attendance and bring the meeting to a close. Cheers all.